Hey church family, it is great to be with you again to spend some time uh, talking about God's Word. And before we jump into our psalm series, I just want to encourage you, encourage you. I know a lot of you are getting to the point now where we've been several weeks in the midst of this and asking that question when it's going to end. And I want you to know as leadership at your church, we are making every plan possible to get us back in church at the earliest possible safe date that we can. Uh, we're waiting to the end of this week to see about the, the shelter in place declarations and when is going to be the first available time that we're going to be able to be back in corporate worship together. I know you're already doing this, but let me remind you to please continue to pray, um, not only for the end to this coronavirus and for healing uh, and for people to be able to go back to work and the economic downfall, but to pray for your church as well as we make those transitions and get ready to get back together corporately. I know we long to be in worship together, and I'm glad that we have that longing. It has been so good for me to realize that throughout the ages, that many times churches have met challenges in being able to come together and meet. And we are seeing for the first time in my lifetime and in many of your lifetimes that are listening to this right now, that the, the church is challenging coming together. And my prayer is that when that time comes and we can all meet back together, you so deeply appreciate the privilege to be able to come freely and assemble that you are going to see church as a number one top priority and commitment. That it is essential not only to the community, but church is essential to your life. So when we do get back together, we're talking about some plans to be able to make that as safe as possible, to be able to practice social distancing. We are looking at phasing church back in where we will begin by just having worship service, not having small groups or Wednesday nights. We're looking at the possibility of having multiple worship services so that you can spread out things like not passing the offering plate and changing the public invitation time, not having meet and greet times, making sure that we have sanitation stations, as many places that we can have it, and to be able to space people in the sanctuary. So all those things are being thought about right now and planned for as we look forward to being able to announce a date that we pray will be very soon, that you are gonna be able to be invited back uh, and to be a part of what God is doing in our church building and doing that together. But today I have the privilege to talk to you about a beautiful psalm of scripture, a praise song. In fact, it was a, a song of praise in the Israelite community. And if you are studying along with me, please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, you're gonna notice in just a moment that when we read this psalm, so many of you are gonna be familiar with it because there is a song, Psalm 24, that has been fashioned after this song, a powerful song. And I think that when we set some of these psalms to music, they may be even closer to how they were supposed to be heard and understood uh, as they were used in the Israelite and the Jewish community. And so as we begin, before we read this psalm together today, I want us to think about asking the question, do we overuse the word awesome? <laughs> Have you noticed that for decades now, it seems like that word is used for everything. It's used for sporting events. It's used for movies. It's used for food. It is used for every experience under the sun or to describe a vehicle, um, that it is awesome. And certainly when we convey that word, we obviously know there's a, a connotation of positivity with that word. But I wonder sometimes if there aren't some words that we shouldn't shelve and only use them at appropriate times because we really want to convey what we're talking about. I had an elementary school teacher that prohibited us from using the word awesome because when I was in elementary school, that's when that word started being used uh, in the culture so often um, for everything. And it's, it's been here since then. And she prohibited us from describing anything as awesome because she said it was a word that ought to be reserved for God alone, that some words ought to be reserved for God alone. And so when we think about who God is, how breathtakingly transcendent God is, when we say that He is awesome, that He is awe-inspiring, we're going to see in this hymn that that is how the Lord is described in every way as He's magnified and praised. Uh, the background of this hymn is it was a hymn of praise 
that was sung as the Ark of the Covenant made its entry into Jerusalem when it came from the house of Obed-Edom. Tradition tells us that it was sung on the first day of each week and it was sung in corporate worship because it answered a fundamental question. That question, what is acceptable worship? Let's answer that question by reading this psalm together. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God His Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that this King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that this King of glory may come in. Who is He, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So let's answer that question. What is acceptable worship as we walk through this psalm together? First of all, acceptable worship acknowledges God's creation and ownership of the world. It acknowledges God's creation and ownership of the world. Um, many of you are coming up with home projects right now. You've got things going on at the house. Maybe you've done some things that you've been putting off and procrastinating for a long time. One of the things that we enjoy at our family, and we, we've done it earlier this year than we have ever done it, is putting out hummingbird feeders. In fact, we have four on the back porch of my house. And some of you have already noticed that the hummingbirds have already started uh, showing up. They haven't come in droves at our house, but we have as many or two or three at a time that are coming and we're seeing them regularly. Um, one of the reasons that, that we put out feeders is it's the animal that fascinates me. I don't know if it's the most, but it, when you study a hummingbird, it's really incredible. A hummingbird can not only hover, it can fly backwards, it can fly upside down. In its courtship display to impress a female, a male Allen's hummingbird can dive at 61 miles an hour. That means it dives at 380 body lengths per second. That's faster than the space shuttle. A hummingbird's wings beat over 60 times a second. A person is active. If you were as active as a hummingbird, you would have to eat 155,000 calories a day to stay alive. When you think about that a hummingbird's wings beat at 60 times a second, they burn that, that many calories, and yet they are just a speck, just a, such a small animal in the midst of this infinite mystery and beauty of the creation of God, and that's just a hummingbird. And yet Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, all who live on it. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters, which by the way also affirms the Genesis 1 and 2 creation account of how the world came into existence. It's a huge realization that none of this and none of us belong to ourselves, that it all belongs to the Lord. And it helps to put it all in perspective when we recognize that we own nothing. Right now, I think we need to be reminded that this is your Father's world. I think sometimes when we are so worried and so stressed out and so anxious about everything that's going on, we need to know that this is God's world and that it's important to Him, and that He loves His creation, that He takes care of His creation, that He sustains His creation, and so that because it's His, and, and I thought about this in studying this psalm, since day one of creation, God has kept the world in motion. He is the one that makes sure that the sun rises and the sun sets, that the tides are controlled, that the atmosphere is controlled, that everything about our world is as it needs to be so that life would exist. You take approximately 23,000 breaths every day and you don't take one breath a day that He doesn't allow it. He controls even the content of the air so that when you breathe in and when you breathe out, it regulates the things in your body to keep you alive. 
we ought to come before this psalm recognizing that the earth is everything is the Lord's and everything is in it with a knowledge that God has, is the creator of the world, but that He also owns the world and He will take care of the world. So if you believe that, if you believe that God has created the world and owns the world, then the psalm also says that that ought to produce worship in your heart. Remember that this was a song that was sung as the Ark of the Covenant was brought in, as it was sung, a song that was sung very often by the people. And so they understood that once you understand who God is and what God does, it necessitates some things in our individual lives. And that's why it talks about in verses 3 through 6 that it is preceded by a holy life. Who who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So that absolutely nullifies the thought that we can go to worship however we want to go to worship. You have to come before the Lord with a holiness in your heart, a holiness of your life. I have never heard more about hand washing than I have in the past six weeks of my life. Uh, I think our whole culture and society will forever be changed um, because of the demand for sanitation and the habits that we're getting into. I even had a conversation that, uh, with someone recently that there's been a, a company who has already corporately said that there's not going to be any handshakes inside their company, not just during this epidemic, but from now on to try to protect sanitation. And as we think about all those things, we recognize now that there was actually a time in history where there was a fight in the medical community about whether or not there was a need to wash hands. In fact, it, it was a fight that was held extremely, that, that it got extremely tough in this effort that to help people to understand the need to wash your hands, to remove bacteria, to not transfer it from one place to the other. And I think that when we think about what worship holds, when we say we've got to have clean hands and a pure heart, it's that you can't come before the Lord and worship Him when your life is dirty and you've got unrepentant, unconfessed sin in your life. One of the great myths of the modern day is that you can come and worship God unencumbered if you have unconfessed habitual sin in your life. If you want to change your worship, if you want to change the way you're connecting with God, if you want to change your praise, if you want to change those things in your life, it's because right now you need to think about the things in your life that God may be convicting you of. And take that convic conviction before the Lord and confess sin and turn from that sin. And when that happens, you come before the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart and you're able to truly worship Him. He further says that, He's not someone who does not lift his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. It's talking about that we can't worship the Lord if we're worshiping anything else, including ourselves. We can't worship the Lord correctly if we're bearing false witness, if, there's, if the speech in our life is not holy and pure. And that's one of the things that I think ought to convict us is that with the same mouth we use to praise God and sing our favorite praise hymns, it's the same mouth that we use to curse and to gossip. And so the Lord says we ought to think about what it is that comes out of our mouth because that is with the same mouth that we're to issue praises to a holy God. We acknowledge God's creation and ownership of the world. We know that we must be, worship must be preceded by a holy life. And then we have an ever-expanding view of the majesty of God. Verse 7, Lift up you heads, O ye gates, be lifted up you ancient doors, that this King of glory may come in. This is a personification in indicating that the gates must expand to make room for the awesome presence of God. That the gates must get bigger for God to even be able to enter in because of His magnificence. This would have been a question in verses 8 and 9 that is asked by the priest. When he says, who is this King of glory? The priest would have asked that question and then the people would have answered the question, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. It is the asking and answering of the question that shows that there is an ever-expanding view of the majesty of our God. It is a call on us today to face the reality of what J.B. Phillips captured in his classic little book, your God is too small. Friends, if you want to increase your worship, realize that you have a magnificent, awesome God who is so incredible 
that if our view of Him is not constantly and ever expanding, then we have missed out on His majesty and His glory. I want you to know this week that we are praying for you and excited about soon being able to get back together again. And in the meantime, I pray that you would be asking that question of the Lord, who is this King of glory? And that you would answer it in your own prayer life. The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. Pray with me. Lord, we bow before you today and ask that in our hearts you would find our worship acceptable because we understand that you not only created, but you own this world. That we would come before you with clean hands and a pure heart, would repent and confess sin in our lives. And that, Lord, that we would ever have an expanding view of just how majestic you truly are. In Jesus' name, amen.